Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Building Resiliency Emergency Water Treatment System. I want to make everyone aware that we may experience some technical difficulties due to so many people being on the network. In addition, this webinar is recorded. For webinar support, please send an email to caesarcoms at epa.gov. Next slide, please. Your audio is muted. So to ask a question, select Q&A on the right side of the screen and type your question in the Q&A box, then select send. Feel free to type your question in the Q&A box at any point during the webinar. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Closed captioning is available. Select captions slash subtitles in your video controls. To change the caption language, select settings then captions slash subtitles and choose a language. Next slide, please. Anyone on today's webinar may receive a certificate of attendance. To do so, you must attend this live webinar for 60 minutes. If you did not request a certificate of attendance upon registration and would like one, send an email to caesarcoms at epa.gov. Just a note, EPA cannot guarantee the acceptance of certificates by your organization, nor can certificates be provided for viewing the webinar recording. Next slide, please. Thank you for being with us today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. EPA's Dr. James Goodrich, Senior Scientist with the Office of Research and Development's Center for Environmental Solutions and Emergency Response. He's currently responsible for full-scale evaluations of water infrastructure decontamination, innovative emergency water treatment technology, and emergency storm water response mitigation tools. Next slide, please. WaterSteps Markov, motivational speaker and founder and CEO of WaterStep, a nonprofit organization that works to save lives around the world with safe water. Under Mark's leadership, WaterStep has designed and built groundbreaking tools trainings, networks, and technologies that have advanced the fight against waterborne disease and improved the lives of 4 million in 55 countries around the world. Next slide, please. Curtis Daniels, Vice President and Director of Training and Field Operation at WaterStep. Curtis is the lead designer for what is known today as the Water on Wheels cart, where he has taken all of WaterStep's simple technologies and put them all together in one manageable place. With that, I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. James Goodrich. Thanks, Amelia. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, James. All right, well, thank you all for spending some time with us this afternoon as we describe our Water on Wheels Mobile Emergency Water Treatment System, also known as our WOW cart. Uh, next slide, please. And what I'll do in the beginning, I'll spend a few minutes just talking about our goals in jointly developing this technology. I will go over how we uh, reviewed the technology, challenged it, uh, took it to our test beds, and then uh, get into what we are doing now in our test facility in uh, going further with the design. And then we'll be turning it over to Waterstep and Mark and Curtis. Uh, next. Now, in the Homeland Security Research Program, our primary mission is dealing with emergency response, recovery, and mitigation, and in this case, water systems. Uh, the response is immediately after some sort of incident, whether it might be a dirty bomb, a drone, a uh, industrial accident, anything where you have a wide area contamination capability, where you may need to treat water, that has been used to wash down buildings, vehicles, streets, so on. And so you, you need to treat that water so it can be discharged to a collection system or be reduced in volume and sent to a secure landfill. In this, uh, moving next on to recovery is where we'll be focusing uh, today's presentation is the provision of drinking water of a compromised distribution system. You know, wherever you might have a boil water advisory, uh, this is what we're looking at, where you have a treated drinking water in a distribution system that is now compromised because of a lack of power, uh, cross connections, 
multiple or large scale main breaks. And the third phase of this is mitigation, the reliant, resilience, building resilience with the community. But where can these devices be, be pre-deployed before they are actually needed, such as hospitals, prisons, nursing homes, et cetera? Uh, next, please. So in, in developing this technology, we had in the back of our mind, you know, who could be using the wild card? You know, first responders, state, rural water associations, nonprofits, and corporate disaster relief teams. And what I found recently is that corporate disaster relief teams are really big players when it comes to responding to water incidents. And the, the use or the, app, the staging of the wild cart, as you'll see in the uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana deployment later on, is using it in a central staging area. Um, other locations could be satellite operations across the distribution system. You know, kind of think of like lily pads where you have uh, the water tree, the wild card located strategically across the distribution system. Jails and prisons. This is actually the genesis of the wild card. Uh, the city of Louisville had multiple water main breaks and they were within hours of having to move all the residents of their city jail and juvenile detention center to uh, a hotel. And so you can just think about the logistical and financial and security nightmare that could have created. Other applications are like uh, firefighter camps in the you know, west and the, and the range fires. And then also, again, as I mentioned, with the hospitals, clinics, and nursing homes. Uh, next, please. And so going back to the recovery mitigate, mitigation stage, we'll be looking at uh, the provision of safe water, not just for drinking, but for cooking, cleaning, laundry, uh, you know, to supplement and reduce the need for bottled water. Uh, you just, you know, you have a solid waste issue with the bottled water. And I think you can only guess, you know, what kind of residual water is left in those bottles that ends up being in a landfill for quite a while. Next, please. Now the water cart itself, it's as you see here, it's it's mobile, it's versatile. Uh, the treatment train that's built into it can be used, uh, reconfigured on site as to fitting whatever the raw water is and whatever the end use of the water needs to be. Uh, we've had bag filters, cart we can do various filtration systems, various media absorption, with GAC, you can put ion exchange. There's chlorine gas uh, bleach generated, and we are putting a, an LED UV system on it. Uh, as you see it rotating here, uh, the prototype of this, you really could have passed for a shopping cart. It uh, was gray metal, it was shorter, had a handle on it, uh, smaller wheels. Uh, you, know, you put a wobbly wheel in the front and it could have passed for a shopping cart. And so, you know, this is the stage, the version we're working with now. And um, you know, we'll, be, we'll be showing a little bit more detail on the various components of it. Uh, as you see there, the generator in the lower portion, lower right of the cart, uh, that is a dual fuel generator where it can, the cart can be operated off the electrical grid. You can just plug it in. You can run off gasoline or propane. And it's also built to be easily transportable. It's about four feet long, four feet uh, tall and only 30 inches wide. So once it's on the ground, it can roll through doorways and be transported very easily. So, and the way we did this was through the Federal Technology Transfer Act. We utilized a cooperative research and development agreement, a CRADA, with WaterStep, and them being a nonprofit, and the CRADAs can be used with anybody. So next slide. So federal labs can work directly with private companies, for-profit companies, as well as NGOs. And we can do research collaboratively. We can provide facilities to each other, expertise. Uh, we just don't have money changing hands. And so we have developed a patent with WaterStep. The federal government and WaterStep are co-holders of the patent. 
It is patent pending right now, and they also are, if not already, are close to having an exclusive license. And so this really is a win-win for private partners and the federal government. Uh, what we can't do as a federal lab is to uh, mass manufacture, market these things, and endorse them in the United States, and invest in them. And all, but it's also good to know for the private companies that the company confidential business information is protected, and it's not subject to FOIA request. And so I know that alleviates a lot of the concerns that working with private companies have with the creatives. Uh, other federal agencies do this quite a bit. It's a little bit more limited by the EPA, but it is growing in its use. Uh, next, please. So in terms of our research approach, when this all first started, we had uh, just bench scale testing. We took components of the cart that Mark and Curtis had uh, put together, and we tested them at our test and evaluation facility located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the t &E facility is a 24,000 square foot high bay, and it's located on the property of Cincinnati's wastewater treatment plant. So it's a very functional and uh, quite flexible facility for us to uh, develop research. Uh, we took the pilot scale cart uh, to our water security test bed. That's another unique facility that um, our laboratory has, and it's located near Idaho Falls on the property of the, Idaho, of the DOE Idaho National Lab. And so we challenged it there. Uh, following that uh, challenge, a Hurricane Maria hit in Puerto Rico and Water Step deployed to Puerto Rico with components of the cart and they'll be telling you about that later. Following that deployment, uh, the, the cart we have now uh, was challenged once again at our test and evaluation facility using secondary wastewater, hitting it with water. Uh, about comp you know, it's about equivalent to a urban stream in terms of its quality, color, turbidity, and bacterial levels. We then took the well cart out back out to our water security test bed. Um, I think the water security test bed has been uh, the subject of other webinars, but that's a whole other uh, unique facility that uh, you need to check out if you get the chance. But uh, we, we, we spiked the 28,000 gallon lagoon with uh, lots of E. coli and diesel fuel and then ran it uh, through the, the wild cart. And then following that, it was uh, deployed to Lake Charles, Louisiana. Water Step had the opportunity there. And along the way, we've been uh, looking to tweak the cart, try other op options. We've had discussions with FEMA and uh, trying to incorporate some of their recommendations. Next, please. So here's a little bit more of a close up of the cart. This is it sitting out at our water security test bed. Uh, you can see at the lower right corner where you have a raw water inlet, you can just throw a hose into a river, a lake, a pond, or you can even just connect a hose to a building, you know, a regular garden type hose, and we can treat that. And you'll see that uh, with the Lake Charles deployment. The, the dual fuel generator is transported with the cart and then comes off for operation. Water flows through pre-filters. Uh, next slide, please. Goes through media tanks if needed. You see the white hoses there. Those are all quick connects. If you don't, don't need to go through a GAC tank or ion exchange tank, you can bypass it and just go directly to the chlorine gas generator and then on out to uh, storage. And we typically use a, a 1250 gallon bladder tank to store the water once it's been treated, either for distribution or for retreatment if necessary. Also on the cart, you see the liquid bleach maker in the upper right corner. That is where we can uh, develop or make a bleach solution. It's as if you take a, you know, just some off the shelf chlorine bleach, mix it with water with your bleach solution for general sanitation. And that can run in parallel or alone, you running off a deep cycle battery um, you know, that's recharged with a solar panel. There are also outlets and USB ports on the cart, so you can plug in your phone, your laptop, and recharge while you're out in the field. Next, please. And so some of the results 
of our various challenges. Uh, one of the bigger items we did was the BG, the Bacillus globigii spores. That is an anthrax surrogate we use for a lot of our evaluations. It's a very conservative, a very sticky organism, and we operated in a batch mode at our test bed where the water is treated and stored in a bladder tank. And you can see we were getting seven log reductions and we're able to crank up the chlorine very high if need be for very tough contaminants. Um, if you're gonna be drinking that water, you know, you can polish that running the water back through the carbon tanks. Uh, we've got adequate CT levels for microbial testing. Uh, when we did the flow through, when we went from a batch to a flow through process uh, using secondary wastewater at the T&E facility, we we're easily getting five and six log reductions in, in E. coli and total coliforms with just one pass through the cart. And the same at the lagoon. The uh, diesel fuel levels were reduced to non-detect. Uh, however, there was an operational issue in that this lagoon had a turbidity of over 100, 120, 130 consistently. So obviously the GAC tanks lasted maybe an hour and a half to two hours before uh, the tanks would have to be changed out. So next steps, next slide. So what we've come to the point so far to this now is that we do have a final report. We do have a user manual and you know, those are available. We also, we are in the current process now of trying different modifications. Uh, based on what we found with the, the carbon tanks clogging, uh, the FEMA recommendations, we're looking at perhaps having multiple modular carts where you may have a cart uh, strictly for chemical removal or, or rad removal. You have multiple larger carts operating in parallel or in series. Uh, you could have a pretreatment cart with uh, you know, multimedia filtration or something like that if you're dealing with a, a water quality similar to our lagoon. And we are constantly looking at different filtration opportunities uh, with micro ultrafiltration and nanofiltration. And then we're also needing to uh, incorporate, you know, real time reporting out capabilities, flow pressure using ORP as a surrogate for chlorine residual. You know, a first responder, we don't want them to be tied to babysitting the cart while it's treating water. And so, you know, where we're at now, we're back at our T&E facility. Uh, we're looking at other specific designs, maybe spatial needs for spatial parts of the country and looking to uh, partner once again, either within the agency or without, outside. Next, please. So where we're at now, this is a couple shots of our test and evaluation facility in Cincinnati. Uh, we can pull in raw water, secondary wastewater. We can tank in any kind of river water, lake water. Uh, we can mix it with dechlorinated Cincinnati tap water and pretty much provide any kind of raw water influent to the wild card. On the right hand side, you can see one of our, our research pad. There's a, an empty cart there waiting to be filled with a treatment train. And this is where we can evaluate different types of technologies and configurations. Next, please. And it's a little bit close up of one of our recent uh, configurations where you have the, the black filters at an angle. That's a pretreatment filter. We tried a couple different types of pretreatment filters. There in the middle, the stainless steel housings, we've tried different size bag filters, cartridge filters, different pore sizes. 10 micron, 5 micron, 0.1s, what have you. Uh, in the upper right, the silver unit there, that's the UV LED unit we're, we're working on, trying to get enough flow through it and contact time. And we've been challenging it with the Bacillus globigii spores as well as Legionella. And then next to it, you see the chlorine generator. Uh, and even behind that, you can see that I have a tall, thin um, unit. That was a electrocoagulation unit we're playing with, trying to determine what kind of simple to operate pretreatment we might be able to incorporate. And so that's where we are now. 
we are looking to continue that work. If uh, folks from the EPA regions or various states have a particular I don't know, tweak or need, uh, we'd be glad to work with you. And I think with that, I'll turn it over now to uh, Mark and Curtis, and they can uh, fill you in on the, the deployments. Thanks, Jim. Uh, great job. Uh, um, Amelia, can you hear us OK? Are we doing all right? Absolutely, sounds good. Fantastic. It's an honor to be with you guys um, today. Thank you uh, for joining the program. We're, we're excited to be at this level to be able to introduce you to the wild cart and to its history and, and how it's been able to work. At Waterstep, we've been around for 26 years and our goal is to make sure that we see the day when no child die of waterborne illness. In the midst of that, uh, we've had a chance to work with people in the developing world and to be able to imagine tools that they might need to be able to solve their own uh, health and sanitation issues. We've been able to come up with very simple solutions that are affordable and able to, uh, to be operated actually by anybody, else, anybody on the planet. And what happened with us in disasters is we've been doing disasters since uh, 2009 we happened to be in Costa Rica. There was an earthquake, 3,800 people displaced, and we were able to apply the work that we've done in the developing world to the disaster. And we realized that there was some potential for the type of equipment that we were uh, using and manufacturing. Next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. Thanks, William. So what we work in at Waterstep is, is in the wash sector, water sanitation and health. Uh, so much of what we do is about community development. A lot of our equipment is able to be used uh, to actually build uh, businesses, uh, financial uh, assistance for communities and families. And then we're able to get information back and forth through a lot of field consultants that we have in over 60 countries uh, to be able to tweak and apply uh, best practices that they learn with each other and, and they're able to share with each other and then be able to tweak uh, tools like the uh, the wild card. And we're excited to share a little bit more about how we've done that today. Next slide, please. So this is uh, some products on the wild card. Waterstep has gotten some pretty major honors for and now with our work with EPA, we've been able to have some honors as well. So I want you to know that what's happened with the components, as, as Jim mentioned earlier, Curtis is being able to put these in, in a very unique way. These components are rock star components and brought together, they have an extremely unique capability uh, for, again, simplicity, low power needs, the uh, versatility and the bandwidth that a disaster worker is gonna be able to have when they're in the field is absolutely incredible. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about Puerto Rico. When Puerto Rico hit, a lot of folks ask, and you may be wondering, well, how does Waterstep get to disasters and in the places that they go? Our goal is to make sure we don't show up anywhere unless we're working with somebody on the ground who's got the capacity to bring us in in a way that helps us to apply what we've got to people there that can make a sustainable solution. In Puerto Rico, we work with uh, General Electric and some other folks in the, the country there to actually set up a training base for disaster workers from every one of the 78 municipalities that could come from the field, learn the equipment, and then immediately take that back out of the field. We were actually able to fund that and donate that equipment to each one of the 78 municipalities. The amazing thing was, it was a stripped down version of the wild part, came with bladder tanks, uh, the, uh, capacity to be able to manufacture uh, safe water as well as uh, the ability to, to, to have a sanitation solution. When these disaster workers would show up, uh, we had training sessions scheduled morning and then a session in the afternoon. They would literally, some of them began to weep from the field because they were able to see the, the incredible change that they were able to make with their hands-on work. They were actually able to do something they never had been able to do before. And that's what we love about the wild card is we're able to provide those workers the capability to provide all the water, safe water that they can imagine 
supplying as well as disinfectant and sanitation uh, solutions. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about Lake Charles, uh, which was another opportunity for us just these past few months ago. Again, we contacted some people that we knew in that area. We happened to be able to connect with uh, a, a church there that was providing a base of operation with the sheriff's department, uh, military personnel, uh, landing pads for helicopter. We had uh, the Red Cross there, the Baptist disaster relief teams were there, about 800 people at this base. And what we were able to do is we actually trained a very unique way that we were excited about testing out for ourselves as we as water staff, staff and, and members did not take the wild card down there. We actually trained two members uh, of different organizations. One was called Reach Out Worldwide and another one was called, was called the Sirens Project out of uh, Georgia. They came to our facility, you could see them there. We, we trained them and then they actually put the cart in the back of a pickup truck and drove that to that base of operation for the disaster workers in Lake Charles. Uh, Curtis is gonna talk a little bit more about what happened there, but the amazing thing is we wanted to test and make sure that we had that, that, uh, that train, if you will, of being able to have one person train another person and then other people that showed up to the disaster be able to be trained again and again and again, and that training to be able to follow a path of excellency so that folks really knew what they were doing. We were very successful with that. Curtis and I showed up after about three groups had been trained down the line. Next slide, please. And so Kurt's gonna talk a little bit about some of the detail that we were able to provide there and the impact that that was able to have not only to the training center or the, I'm sorry, the, the base of operations for these 800 workers, but also the community where people were driving in all day long, getting meals and supplies and that kind of thing. Kurt? Yeah, <clears throat> you can all hear me okay as well, I'm assuming. That's good. Okay, um, once again, I'm Curtis Daniels. It's an honor to be here today to be able to share some of this um, exciting technology with you. Um, here in Lake Charles, um, as you can see up on the screen, uh, we have a big tanker up in the back there. Uh, we were told that uh, that tanker showed up at the, at the beginning of the event. Uh, they were under a uh, boil alert. Um, it was full of water that was safe to drink, um, but then there it sat. Um, what we were able to do was, was pull off the municipal water, run it into the cart, as Jim had mentioned, like they had done at the test bed, by pulling out of the lake, we were able to hook this up to the uh, municipal water system, run it through um, chlorination into the, uh, the bladder tank, testing our, our levels of chlorine in there um, under a boil alert. And, um, and what we were, the, the team was able to do was to keep that tanker full of water. Um, over the exercise, they did over 100,000 gallons of water um, coming off the, the municipal system through the cart uh, through chlorination, chlorination into the bladder tank. That's a 1,250 gallon bladder tank. And then we would pump it up into the, uh, the tanker to, um, to supply um, the showers, the, uh, the laundry facilities, um, all of the cook stations that were put on by the uh, Baptist um, disaster relief groups and the Red Cross. And then the Red Cross is cleaning stations where they would um, have to clean all of the and inspect all of the, uh, the food prep materials, pots, pans, uh, utensils, all of those different and, and the crates that they that they sent those uh, those meals out in. Um, there was about uh, 16,500 meals made per day that not only fed the 800 plus first uh, first responders that were outside of the church there. But it also um, fed anybody who needed food within the community. And that averaged out to about 16,400, 16,500 meals a day. It just kind of went back and forth a little bit. Um, the, the wonderful thing about this was by the time Mark and I got there, um, we were the third group in, is the gentleman you see in the picture there in the yellow shirt. Um, he is, uh, was with the Baptist Disaster Relief Group. He really got uh, a hold of this and understood it really well. Um, he didn't know me from Adam's house cat when I walked up on site, but uh, um, 
I, I introduced myself and, and so forth. And he said, man, I'm glad you're here because I was just making sure I was doing everything right. Well, everything that we had seen and done um, was being done exactly right. The thing about this is, is that I didn't know him, he didn't know me, and I don't know which group of people trained him because he's three weeks into it. And um, so that just goes to show that by training two people here at Waterstep for five hours one day and putting them in the back of that pickup truck and sending them down to uh, Louisiana in the back of that truck, um, and then the other people in between him and them and then to Chris, um, nothing got lost in translation, and uh, which was really good. And he was doing a perfect job. Um, with the, the products for, for cleaning, uh, believe it or not, the uh, Red Cross and different um, uh, Baptist organizations on site there were running out of sanitizing product to, uh, to sanitize for the, the dishes and cleaning. Um, in the midst of this, um, I do believe there was over 50 gallons of, uh, of sodium hypochlorite bleach made off the cart. He was just running those um, during the day while he was sanitizing, checking water, making sure everything else was great. Um, and, and what's really important about this is that we were using, you know, we were using potable water, but you don't see a bottle of water sitting around here. Um, there was bottled water on site. I'm not, I'll be very transparent about that. There was a lot of bottled water on site that, was, that emergency workers and so forth were using. But the, the main thrust of water being used by the people, especially the 800 plus responders on site, were being used from the uh, municipal water under boil alert, going into that 1,250 gallon bladder tank and into that uh, storage tanker um, to be distributed to the, the showers and laundries and, and food prep areas. Um, which I, I, I preface saying this because of the next slide. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about that. So we're big on not being jazzed about bottled water and water step. And one of the reasons I think we can say this is we want to just show you some things that, that you may or may not uh, be able to, uh, to have at the front of your mind all the time. Or wrap your head around Yeah, it. exactly. This kind of crazy numbers. And, and Jim was blown away. He found these and I'm like, okay, I'm researching those. And I, we've looked at the C-130 together. It's kind of crazy. So let's look at those 18 days that we use the wild cart on site. Uh, producing over 100,000 gallons of, of water and, and the bleach solution uh, for sanitation handed off to different people. The wild cart cost uh, retail uh, is 40 grand. So now let's look at the same cost if we took that water and used that for, uh, for bottled waters. We're looking at 800,000 bottles of water. The cost would be over $180,000 plus transport. Now here's what we've got to get tricky. That's 416 pallets that would take 16 tractor trailers to bring in for those 18 days. That's almost a tractor trailer a day. And C-130 flights can only hold about 44,500 pounds, which again would take 20 C-130 flights in to bring that type of, uh, that, that amount of water in just for those 18 days. What we're trying to talk about today is a paradigm shift that will allow us to help to bring other options in between bottled water and those expensive reverse osmosis machines that require a uh, technical person on site. Uh, they're huge water hogs. Uh, I'm sorry, not water hogs, but um, uh, power hogs and hungry for, for power. This fits a niche right there between those and helps us bridge the gap between bottled water and something else while uh, systems are being be, being online, put online, and and being ready uh, for folks to be able to uh, to be back um, in, in, a, in some sort of sense of normalcy. So keep that in, in your mind. What uh, what we're excited about is we've got a website now. Well, um, Waterstep Wildcard, and on that dot com at waterstepwildcard.com, you can find out more information. We're going to show you a short video now about Lake Charles. But we've gotten this award I mentioned earlier with the EPA for the Teddy Roosevelt Award. That, that is on there that talks about the development of the wild cart. 
And then there's a place on there for us to begin. We've started collecting people that are interested in water and disasters and how we can begin to network and look at solutions like this that could be very, very different in a way for us to change the way things are always done. Next slide, please. So we're going to show this video. And one of the things that we're looking at now is you may be thinking, depending upon where you're working, I'm worried about using something like this, a tool like this that uh, doesn't fit what's been approved. I'm worried about how people on the ground are able to operate that. So we're here to help you understand how that can happen. Let, let's play this video, please. Starting to lose hope. I wonder if you can get through this. And I cried. I cried. Going down. You know, churches and, and relief help. I just couldn't help. I couldn't believe. Y'all don't know what that means to us. We had the great opportunity to. Uh, to work a couple years ago in the Carolinas. Another opportunity has just come up with this Hurricane Laura that blew into uh, Louisiana, Southern Texas. And this whole entire area is under a boil alert, which means that the municipal water coming through the plumbing system of the city, of this community, um, is not safe to drink. Without clean water, we can't do anything. We can't guarantee people's health, people's safety. The only way that we can guarantee that is through water filtration, through bleach through cleaning every surface that you see. In combination with the uh, Baptist Disaster Relief folks, we were able to uh, um, hook the equipment up and we have been able to keep that tanker filled up. That tanker is supplying water to all of the food that's being done here, which is about 16,800 meals a day. So the water is supplying them with water. It's supplying the shower stalls for all the workers. 6,000 gallons of water a day. Chris, we want to give you everything that you need to get people excited like you and to know that they've got tools to do this. The water step has uh, graciously donated this, this wild cart and purify all the water from the showers to the tank to the food service to whoever needs water. I hope and pray that, you know, we don't have any more disasters, but we will, you know, we'll have something like this here to purify all the water that we, we need and to continue to keep people safe. We're just constantly making bleach to supply to anybody that needs it. The fact that it has the sanitation part on it that will produce and replace all these gallons of bleaches and plastic again to throw away that's coming in. I think that it's a solution to so many problems from distribution to clean up to supply and demand and everyone has a need it can fit. It's a mini water treatment plant that we brought in the back of a pickup truck and we set it up in the parking lot and we're capable of supplying all of these folks with safe water. If it's not sanitary, there's a chance people get sick. Resources are lost when people are sick and we're already losing enough resources in a disaster. Mark and Curtis, you are you're still muted. Bad. Oh, sorry. OK, thanks, Amelia. It's uh, exciting to hang out with you guys. Uh, we're going to turn it back over to Jim here in a minute, but it's great to be able to, to start talking about this in a larger network so that we can get information back from you guys and help us know how we can better tweak this and customize this. That's a great thing that Jim was talking about earlier. This thing allows people to be able to use what they need on the cart, to dial that in, if you will, 
and we're looking forward to talking to so many other folks about this so we can get these positioned out there. There's no reason that in these storm corridors, we can't have these carts positioned along the way because we know the storm's coming. So Jim's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what's been happening and even the last couple of months, how we've been working to build a network and address uh, working uh, with folks in a variety of different disasters. Jim? Thanks, Mark. Amelia, Mike, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so really would like to almost kind of open this up, you know, just before general questions and try to get some guidance from you all and that, you know, the last couple months, you know, we've been approached or been aware of uh, a community in Alaska losing their water treatment capabilities through a fire. Uh, you know, you had the Texas freeze. There's all kinds of flooding going on in the south and in Kentucky. And just the last 24 hours, we've had multiple tornadoes throughout the south. And so it's really a really kind of a shotgun approach of how do we get the, the wild card into the catalog of first responders and make it a tool that's easily accessible and, and not just kind of, you know, leaving it up to Waterstep or other NGOs to get invited and really to take, to get past some of the concerns that local health departments or states, communities may have with this uh, odd looking little device that's treating water. And so we, we have had, are in the midst of having conversations in Texas, Kentucky, Florida, as well as, um, you know, looking into and having conversations with the WARN network that occurs that's in each of the states, rural water associations and so on. And so this is kind of where we're at. We're, we're always looking at uh, improving the technology, its flexibility, its capabilities. Um, you know, we've reached a point now where uh, we really do need to get this more in some sort of acceptance as uh, at the state level, at the FEMA level, uh, the EPA first responders and so on. And, and so that's kind of where we're at now. And uh, we just uh, just want to turn it back over to uh, Amelia. And uh, you know, next slide is our contact information. And uh, I'm sure we'd Love to be uh, addressing some of the questions and some of the technological details that we've kind of skimmed over through the presentation. Hey, Jim, it's Lonnie. I'm actually going to ask some questions, so um, let me go to them. So here's here's one of the first ones. What is the cost to the chlorine that was used for 18 days? Um, I'll kick it off and Curtis, you can jump in, but basically the, the chlorine is generated from electricity and table salt. Uh, the consumables are almost negligible in that, uh, you know, with the, the bleach maker and the chlorine generator, you're just using salt and electricity and generating the, uh, the chlorine bleach solution and the chlorine gas. Curtis? Yes, that, 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 that's a really good question. Um, in the, uh, in the midst of the 50 gallons of, of, uh, of sodium hypochlorite bleach that was made on site at the Louisiana St. Charles um, or Lake Charles, um, you're probably looking at less than, uh, less than $40. Some are probably around $30 in, in, uh, in salt that was used throughout the whole, the whole ordeal. Uh, we sent um, 40 pounds of salt um, with the cart, um, by the end of the event, there was probably about two or three pounds of salt left, and they had used it daily for all everything that they had done the whole time there. So, um, if you look at you know Morton's being the most expensive at about uh, seventy nine cents, eighty cents a pound, um, it ain't much. it's not much. <laughs> hey, and a, a follow-up question to that, what's the percentage of the bleach? 6%, 12.5%? No, it, no, it's uh, the, the bleach solution. Um, it, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question as well. If you're looking at a bottle of Clorox, you know, which is, you know, 5 to 8% in strength, um, that's some really, really strong stuff and has to be diluted down quite a bit. Um, the... Uh, 
judging by or going by the size of the containers that we have, which is a pre-measured amount of water, pre-measured amount of salt, and um, an electrical charge going into an anode cathode cluster, um, which is specific in length, thickness, um, width, the whole thing, um, we are able to to make a solution that exceeds uh, 5,000 parts per million. Um, the reason that's a critical number is because the World Health Organization tells us that in order to address the worst thing possible, which is a bloodborne pathogen um, in, a, in a cleanup, uh, Ebola, um, typhoid, anything that, um, that, would, that has body fluids connected to it, i.e. blood, diarrhea, vomit, any of those things in a clinical situation, um, it has to be 5,000 parts per million minimum. Um, and then it, it reduces down for general cleaning, which is at, um, uh, at 500 parts per million. And when you get down to water, it's even lower than that. I mean, it's like 2. Point, you know, 2.5 to 3.0 parts per million. Um, so we 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 are at we've we've manufactured a device that will take it up to the worst thing and slightly above but not higher than that because we don't want somebody in the field um, getting injured by it or, or, or going through the risks of, of making it like Clorox, for example, at five or eight percent. The potential's seven, seven thousand five hundred parts per million. Yeah, it, usually. And yeah. You'll, you'll reach there. But the nice thing is you can cut that, you can use it in a variety of strengths. And remember, for us, we're always thinking the, the whole reason behind the bleach merits and our story is we answered the Ebola virus problem in, in Liberia. Um, and we just got done with the Ebola virus in the Democratic Republic yeah. of Congo, and the Minister of Health for the entire country said this and a strategy for the doctors was, was the reason that was abated. So that's what we're always thinking. The cool thing is, it was a rock star during COVID, and this is a great tool that, that does all it needs to do uh, for for us in situations like this. Just as a as a as a note, um, being they were you, as you can see in that video uh, when they were uh, pressure spraying things down, all of those pressure sprayers were the vat they were coming out of had had uh, water and bleach in there, and it was bleach that was made by the by the bleach maker. Um, that mixture was one to nine which means that you know for one gallon of bleach it was nine gallons of water which gave 10 gallons of, of fluid one gallon of the bleach to the bleach one, maker right one gallon of bleach with the bleach maker um which literally is um really almost in their it's about uh less than less than 20 cents someplace probably around anywhere from 14 to 18 cents per per time you do that let's get some more questions sure maybe this one um can go to jim um, Jim, what's the flow capacity for the cart? How many people can it serve in a day? And is it is that different if there's different water sources that you're cleaning? Well, it typically runs about 10 gallons per minute. And um, basically it can run all day. Um, you know, if you have a very dirty water source, uh, there, there could be some downtime to, uh, you can unscrew the pre-filters and hose them off and put them back in. Um, you know, if you do have the media filters in there, there might be some change out, but uh, it's pretty much, you can plug it in or run it off the generator. I guess the generator runs for what, about four hours, Curtis, uh, before you refill it. Yeah, it runs uh, It runs a little bit longer on propane, but yeah, four hours is a good, good span. And the chlorine generator itself, um, it can run 24 hours a day if, if you want. There's nothing to break in these these pieces of equipment that we're talking about. The water step provides that we don't know how long they last indefinitely. Is, is what we got right now. I can tell you that we were doing six to ten thousand gallons of water per day on site at uh, Lake Charles. Another question uh, regarding the cart: Which wavelength LED and what intensity do you use? The work we're doing on the LEDs has three different wavelengths. I think it's 255, 265, and 285. And so you have a mixture, so you have a variety. Uh, different wavelengths work better for different contaminants. And so we're still, we're actually have another crater with a, a UV LED uh, manufacturer where we're doing that research as we speak. And, uh, but 
we do know that uh, we can fit it on the cart. And so we'll have multiple filtration steps and multiple disinfection steps. But so right now it's just a three uh, UV length, length wavelengths. Thanks, Jim. And I'm going to um, put two questions together. So what are the what are the feed raw input water requirements? Can it be used with a gray water cycle? And then do you need to run any drinking water analysis before using the water at the site? We've not uh, run gray water through it. We have had the secondary wastewater. Um, it was actually, as far as secondary wastewater, it's actually pretty good. So we've, uh, the worst challenges we've had is the lagoon uh, out at the test bed. And, uh, well, you know, we tried some Ohio River water, which was pretty rough. But basically, the raw water characteristics, that's just going to impact how often you have to uh, clean pre filters or media filtration steps. And can I address that too? Yep. Yeah. Um, we ran some tests off the Ohio River. Um, raw water um, in the dead of August. Um, I was with uh, Dr. Joe Jacoby and a couple of people from our team here down on the river um, in, in, uh, with the Louisville Water Company also um, at, kind of at our side. And we were pulling water two feet off the bottom, two feet off the top and about midway using some different pumps and some different simple filtration, very similar to what Jim showed in his uh, uh, up at the TNE Center. And um, we uh, we were running samples up to the Louisville Water Company every hour um, on this on one of the days there. It was a really hot, 105 degree day, Green River, terrible looking water. Um, every result we got back every hour of that day um, was noted safe to drink in an emergency situation. By no means did the water company say that this was Louisville, you know, tap. They didn't say that. But they said that uh, you could drink this water without um, without problems in an emergency situation. Thank you. All right, follow up question: um, Has this been used to provide water in conditions with temperatures below freezing? And if so, what were some of the considerations or adjustments you made to accomplish this? We've just, uh, golly, in this past couple of weeks, we've just been discussing what would be necessary there. So we've not challenged it that that level yet uh, certainly uh, it's something we'd want to do it was a, a concern when we was talking to the folks in alaska and so uh, we're, we're, we're looking at that I, I can also address that we uh, we did have a situation in china uh, a number of years ago when we um, uh, there was a, a big earthquake situation there we um, had some people that were in india that deployed into china using the M100 to sanitize water in um, way below zero um, temperatures. Um, the only thing that was really required of them was to uh, was to keep the system itself warm and whatever storage they were storing the water in afterwards uh, warm enough not to freeze. And uh, besides that, the M100, the M100 manufactured chlorine gas and put it in the water and uh and and made it safe to drink it's extremely robust that that's not the, that won't be the issue all right next question how are the filters shown in the first presentation backwashed and where is the backwash discharged well the, the pre-filters um you basically you unscrew the housing take the filter out and just hose them off put it back in they're um, they're called disc filters. Um, there's a series of about 460 discs that are stacked on top of each other, similar to like how poker chips would be stacked, or old poker chips, or Chinese or checkers. Um, they they have uh, um, micro grooves in them that lock together, and then they compress. Uh, the great thing about that filter is it's not a cartridge that you you know that you uh, that you fill, pull out, chuck, and throw in a new one. Uh, the great thing about this is that you can pull it out wash it off in a bucket of water, um, disengage the discs um, in, in a rack. They don't all come apart, they just come loose. Um, you can walk, rinse those out, recompress the discs back together and put the thing back into uh, operation. And it takes about three minutes.
sorry, I'm reading through the questions. Um, are there are are there any components of NF61 certified? Has any regulatory accredited treated equipment for specific log inactivation? All the uh, the components in the cart uh, are food grade. Uh, it's all best available technology. You know, the everything is commercial that we're using on the cart. Um, you know, we, there's, you know, we haven't been through any state approval processes for those credits. What we're trying to replicate with the multiple filtration steps, uh, the multiple disinfection steps, it's kind of like the surface water treatment rule where you can get the, the goal would be to get the credits for the filtration for crypto, Giardia virus, and then uh, you've got the, the double hit with the UV and the chlorine uh, in order to get uh, the complete treatment train and the removal of the uh, hard to hard to kill pathogens. Thanks, Jim. Have you evaluated this on harmful algal blooms? No, uh, not that's typically a, a filtration uh, operation. Uh, we've not done that yet. Um, yeah, you know, some of the Ohio River we've looked at, it's, it could have been a harmful algal bloom with what we saw, um, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's not been the focus yet. And, and keeping in mind also that um, as Jim was showing you in, in one of the very first photos where um, there's hoses and different things hooked up to it, or you, you know, you can go through the train or you can go through just the chlorine generator or you can go just through filtration in the chlorine generator. You can mix it up, match it any way you want. The great thing about it is, is that with the bypass hoses and the, 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 the manifold that's on top, um, you can plug into it, even if there's filters sitting on the ground, um, you can hook into the, the, the train and put those filters any place you need and, and adjust your filtration to whatever your problem may be. Great. Um, will this cart meet all of the treatment standards required by the state and EPA? I'm assuming that means drinking water. That's the goal. And what is the max production of the wow cart? I guess gallons. Yeah, typically uh, when the whole treatment pr train is engaged, uh, you know, we're looking at 10, 11 gallons per minute. If you're just using the chlorine generator, uh, just to disinfect with the chlorine gas, it can be much more. Um, we we reached, you know, in a in a water that has uh, that is got quality to it that doesn't look like it has a bunch of turbidity or things that you can see with your eyes uh, but maybe um, contaminated with fecal bacteria for example um, we're cap the we've had we've had situations where we've been able to do it at 55 gallons a minute being able to um, chlorinate the water um, having its contact time and then testing again to see where the water, the free chlorine in the water is left. And, um, um, you know, we can do a 500 gallon tank in 18 minutes um, in Haiti, for example. So it really varies depending on what you're going through. And if you're starting to, you know, bog the water down through, through different filters, the disc filters are one thing, you start to get into disc and carbon filter, that becomes another thing. And, and when you start to, you know, push or force water through membranes or, or uh, bag filters down, you know, to the, the 0.1 micron, of course, everything's going to slow way down. So it just really depends on what the water situation is. And in the midst of a disaster, how long would it take to procure the components um, and assemble a wow cart? Ten minutes. Pull it off the truck and you could, uh, it usually takes us longer to get the water in the tank than it does to set it up. And that's even if it comes from the fire department, from a tanker or from a, a hydrant. Um, you know, it, it takes an amount of time for water to go through a, a, a hose and, and fill the, the, uh, the container. So um, the cart does come with bladder tanks. Yeah, so they're yeah. there. Um, you just need the water to fill those up, and you, like Curtis said, as far as the cart and the water goes, just in a few minutes, you're ready to start going. Yeah, it, it literally uh, deploy the tanks out of the ground, fill them up with water, or have your whatever your water supply is coming in, and um, it's literally hooking up several uh, uh, quick connect hoses 
and it's it's ready to go. Yeah, they they could be asking Curtis, Mark, uh, if somebody needed one and called you, uh, how long before they might be able to get one if you have them in stock or if you have to build them. Well, the goal is for us to have uh, have them in in stock that you wouldn't have to wait more than a week to get them. Yeah. If if you know if you needed one today, you could you know if you wanted to pay the shipping, you could have it tomorrow. Yeah, we got we got but, some downstairs ready to go. Right, but it but um, when you start looking at uh, you know keeping in mind we're you know this is this webinar is is kind of showcasing you know this this new this new product that we've been testing over the years, and uh, we do have a number of them built. And as as Jim had mentioned earlier, it, it all started with our local jail and and. Uh, uh, um, youth detention center and our emergency management here in, in Louisville and um, and so we built them as we needed them and, and and then we've started from there and we've had some some changes that we've made which are really great changes uh, and that's all because of, of working very closely with this crater and through the EPA um, to where it is today but um, they built pretty quick I actually had two uh, interns working with me here at Waterstep. They were both ladies. They're both uh, senior in college, seniors in college engineering. And um, with my guidance, um, they built two carts in five days. So um, it was, uh, um, it doesn't take long for us to get them out and, and to ramp that up. It, it just, we do what it takes to do. When we, when we start building more manufacturing, we'll get those out a lot. Yeah. If you need one, holler at us, we're gonna get it to you quick. So we're at about a little after three and we have a lot more questions, but what we're going to do is share the contact information again. And so if anyone has follow up questions for anyone, any of the panelists or uh, you, you want more details on the carts, please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, we hope that you learned a lot about the carts and and um, are interested in it. So thank you for coming today. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you very much. You guys are rock stars. Great job, Ken. Thank you all. It's been a great day. Thank you.